I uh, hope everyone's having a fantastic morning so far, regardless of what you uh, came here with, the stresses, the cares, the the uh, hurts and wounds, the wrestles, the doubts, all of those things. I pray that this would be a place that you find rest and peace uh, in the company of other people who are in search of the same thing and grace and mercy and hope that this is a place that you find love and acceptance and in this group of <coughs> equally terribly flawed people. But the thing that brings us grace and peace and rest is the presence of a loving and a gracious and a holy God. He desires that this morning we come just as we are, but we leave completely different because we have been spending time in his presence. Amen. This week, um, we're going to start a a series. We're going to start looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And my kids have, my kids just finished... um, VBS over at the community church. Some of some of the others here have were there too, and the theme was kids of his kingdom. And this was the first this was the first uh, VBS that we were a part of when we were over there at the community church in 2003 or 2004, one of those years. But Katie was a uh, Katie was a part of that, and uh, she was in the in the outfit and up on stage and singing and. One of the songs that they sang, and they sang it again this year, but one of the songs that they sang uh, back when, when we were there, uh, and uh, it, one of the lines in it, uh, it says, uh, talks about uh, being kids of the kingdom upside down, kings of an, uh, kids of an upside down kingdom. And, uh, and I thought that that would be a good theme, uh, fit well with what we're talking about in this sermon that Jesus gave. And so the title of this series is A Kingdom Upside Down. My prayer is that as we look at the sermon, we would be challenged as believers, as Christians, to look past the superficial, look past the uh, what is on the outside, what we look like and how we present ourselves on the outside and, and go much deeper into what is in our hearts see ourselves as Christ sees us because there's nothing we're hiding from God, right? You all realize that, right? Like we can hide things from each other. We can put masks on and pretend all we want and we can fool each other, but we're not fooling the Lord. We're not fooling the Lord. Christ's bold and uh, honestly sort of scandalous sermon on the Mount challenged those who were hearing it to understand what God was looking for. God was looking for internal righteousness from us, not just external acts, not just looking good on the outside or doing the right thing on the outside or or saying the right thing, but an internal righteousness. Understanding this is only possible through the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. So, Father, as we, as we come before you this morning and we kind of open up some things in your word, I pray that, uh, I pray that your Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you would move and that you would have your way and, and that you would challenge our hearts, that you would spotlight things in our lives that, that maybe uh, uh, are inconsistent with the way that we look on the outside and the way that our hearts uh, are, are operating, our minds are thinking. Father, we want those things to line up. We want a righteousness that, that, that first of all, starts on the inside, a, a purity and a holiness that starts on the inside and, and produces external things rather than just uh, putting on a show. And, uh, um, and then hopefully we'll see that, that is, that's a pretty childish and immature way to, to operate. So, But we cannot... Uh, be revealed. We cannot understand these things without your help, Holy Spirit. So we ask you for your guidance and direction this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So 
Jesus teaches in this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, that internal righteousness is what produces external acts. And that internal righteousness, again, is what is most important. That piece is key. And this is what God's looking for and wanting to produce in us. You know what a, do you know what a keystone is? You know what a keystone is? You may have heard this term. You may have, have, have heard it bounce around or used it and maybe not understood what it is. Uh, a keystone is a central stone at the top of an arch locking the whole thing together. Keystone is, is a, and I think there's a picture above there. That keystone is the piece that holds the whole thing together. If that piece is removed, the whole arch falls apart. To miss the point of the Sermon on the Mount is to miss the keystone of Jesus' teaching, the central piece that holds everything together for us. And this, this sermon that Jesus preaches is considered by most scholars to be the message, uh, the, the most important message of Jesus' teaching ministry. The greatest sermon given of all time. In it are the Beatitudes. Some of you have heard of those. The Beatitudes. In it is the model prayer. In it is the golden rule. And even, even, even the world, even people who aren't familiar with Scripture, who aren't familiar with the sermon, who aren't familiar with Jesus, they even hold many of these things as principles in their lives. Now, they may not know it. They may not know where it comes from. They may not even attribute it to Jesus, but they apply many of these principles in their lives. And this Sermon on the Mount is three chapters long. It's three chapters long. And you go, why such a long sermon from Jesus? Why such a long sermon in Jesus? And I found this interesting, and I, and, and I hope this, I hope this uh, helps us understand just a little bit better. The answer to why such a long sermon from Jesus, the answer is found in the context leading up to chapter 5. Okay, so the Sermon on the Mount starts in, in uh, Matthew chapter 5. Okay, but to understand this sermon just a little bit better in context, we have to look at the other four verses leading up to that. In Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus shows that Jesus, biblical Jesus, had the legal right based on his lineage. He had the legal right to rule Israel. Okay? It was just me. I don't know. Chapter 2 shows that the Gentiles, the Gentiles accepted his kingship, right? We, in chapter 2, we see the Magi or the wise men who were not Jewish individuals. They were Gentiles, and, and they accepted and acknowledged his, uh, his kingship. In chapter 3, John preaches repentance, which was necessary for the Davidic kingdom to be established. John is preaching repentance. So, so all of this stuff is all leading up to, and it's, it's laying the, the foundation and the groundwork for this sermon, for Jesus to have the authority to speak the things that he's speaking in this sermon. Chapter 4, Jesus proves that he was morally worthy to rule by resisting the temptation of the devil, by resisting the temptation of the devil. In the wilderness there, he shows his authority by performing miracles, and biblical Jesus is creating a stir. See, now we have to be explained these things. We have to, we have to understand these things. We have to be explained these things. If you were Jewish and you were in the, in the culture in Jesus' day, these things you would have recognized without having to be explained, right? You would have recognized you, when, you, when you understood the genealogy of Jesus or where he came from and, uh, and Bethlehem and these types of things, you, and you start to put the puzzle pieces together and you hear, you hear, um, uh, you hear John preaching repentance and you, and you go, uh, oh, he, he, you know, he, he, he resisted the temptation. He's morally worthy to rule. And you see these things and you go, oh, this is starting to look like all of a sudden the, the word Messiah starts being. excitement and there's a stir in Israel. And 
this is why you start to see larger crowds come. You see crowds following him around. Is this really the Duke of Lincoln? No, come on. He's a nobody. Let's not, let's just go hear about him, right? Let's just go hear, let's go listen to him. There's a buzz, there's an excitement stirring in Israel. And then in chapter 5, Jesus gives the ethics of his kingdom in this sermon. The ethics of his kingdom. Christ wanted to be sure that everyone clearly understood his expectations of what his kingdom was going to look like. What living in his kingdom looked like. A while back we talked about the kingdom talked about the kingdom. The kingdom is wherever Christ is king. The kingdom is where Christ is king. And if there's no king, there's no kingdom. Okay, And that's why the, these, these chapters leading up to this, he, it, it, they establish his kingship, his right to rule. And if there's no king, there's no kingdom. But if Christ is king, If Christ is king, there are certain behaviors that should follow. And that's what Jesus is addressing in this sermon. He's addressing what he wants his kingdom to be like and those who are a part of his kingdom to behave like. The exact location of the Sermon on the Mount, (coughs) we're not 100% certain, but there is a site in Israel. Katie uh, was there. She was showing me pictures last night. There's a site in Israel that's been honored or kind of commemorated as uh, as the, the site or the, the location or uh, real close to it for more than 1,600 years. And it's on the northeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee between Capernaum and Genesaret. Okay? And there's a picture behind me, I think, and you see the backdrop. So I, wanted, I just wanted you to see the, what, you know, as, 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 the, as they're up on this hill, this mountain, I want you to, wanted you to see what the people were looking at, what Jesus was looking at. The backdrop of Jesus' message was this beautiful scenery of water and mountains. And in Matthew 5, 1, the start of chapter 5, it says this, When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. So the crowd's there. He goes up on the mountain and he sits down. And he sits down just like a traditional rabbi or a traditional teacher would do when they got ready to teach. So any other rabbi, his followers would be following him around. They'd be discussing. And just as I imagine Jesus and his disciples did, they're walking around from place to place. They're laughing. They're they're discussing things. They're talking. And he's doing little teachings. Of course, that's what Jesus did. He just, you know, telling little stories and parables and a truth about the kingdom. And and uh, but uh, but a traditional rabbi, when they got ready to sit to to have a to sit down and give a teaching, or to to give a teaching, they would sit down. And that's what Jesus does here. And I love that while his message that he gives is very different, it was revolutionary to his hearers. He makes it clear, very clear, in verse 17, that he was not about to disregard or ignore or discredit the Old Testament and what the prophets said. Okay? A lot of people use this, uh, the, the, some of these passages, they pull them out and they go, well, we can disregard the Old Testament because Jesus said, you've heard it said, but I say, and so he's disregarding that. He's going, no, that's not, that's not, uh, that, you don't need to look at that anymore. That's not relevant anymore. You don't need that anymore because I'm saying something new. He says this, he says he's not about to disregard the Old Testament and the prophets. He says, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come. I don't know how much clearer he can say it. (laughs) I did not come to abolish 
but to fulfill. He's saying his purpose in coming was not to do away with the old covenant, to, to, to do away with the law. He was not giving a new definition of how to become righteous. He wanted the Jews to understand what God's standards have been the whole time. He was connecting what he, what he was saying. And he, it, the people use it to separate, use these things to separate the Old Testament and Jesus himself. He's actually saying, I'm connecting myself. I'm connecting the things that I'm saying to the things that were said back then. Because you know what? I was there back then. And I, I actually authored that stuff too. He's connecting them, not separating them. And this explains these verses that start out by saying, you have heard it said, but I say, but I tell you. He's not giving them anything new here. He's calling them and us to a deeper, a more mature understanding of the law that was given there. He's bringing us into a more of a mature instead of an infant understanding of the things that he's asking. Think of a child being told from a very young age. Probably most of you have, have told your children this. Uh, think of a child at a very young age told not to touch the stove. Anybody tell their kids that if you have kids? Anybody told that as a kid? Okay. It makes perfect sense to the adult who is giving the warning makes perfect sense to the adult giving the warning, but from the perspective of, of, of the child who is not mature enough to fully understand, it doesn't necessarily make sense. It doesn't necessarily make sense. They are obeying the law of thou shalt not touch the stove out of obedience, but not out of understanding. As the child gets older and matures, so does their understanding of why you're telling them not to touch the stove. From God's perspective, the law provided an external righteousness needed for immature obedience. It provided a, an external righteousness uh, needed for immature obedi obedience until maturity kicked in. Until maturity kicked in, and their understanding of what God really wanted. They thought that external compliance with works of the law were enough to please God. And I think if we're honest, sometimes we can slip into that as well. Sometimes we know things. We know the right thing. We know the right answer. Actually, doing those things is hard. It can be hard. It can be easy. It can be easy to fall into the trap of do's and don'ts. If I do this, God will love me. If I do this, God will be pleased with me. And so we get into these external actions and external things. Keeping up an external image. Pharisees taught this model. The Pharisees modeled this external only compliance. They taught and modeled that people could be righteous because of the, their actions, the way that they dressed, the way that they prayed, the way that people saw them on the outside was the important piece. But this teaching completely ignored purity in the heart. Man looks at the outside and sees the external. God looks at and sees the heart. And their actions could have been right while their hearts were corrupt. Jesus explains that true righteousness, God's righteousness, righteousness that is evidence of being part of God's kingdom, would have to go beyond the external righteousness of the Pharisees. God demands internal righteousness that would then in turn produce external righteousness. In
eternal righteousness that produces, and it's backwards, right? Many times we think, and the Pharisees taught, you do all of these things on the outside and you will be righteous. Jesus is saying, it starts here and then works its way out. Have you ever set up standards in your life to keep yourself safe spiritually? Sometimes like uh, in, in our circle at camp and things like that, we, would, we call them road, roadblocks. These are things that, that you set in, in place to keep, to keep yourself uh, spiritually or physically, to keep yourself from going someplace you shouldn't. Because that's what a roadblock is, right? When, when, uh, when the roads are torn up, we had uh, that last heavy rain we had down by our house. There, was, there were a few roads that had, it said road closed. Okay, That's to keep me from driving into something, from moving into something that is unsafe. Okay, the bridge was out. I did see back in 2017. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, it was some, who sent me that? Did Lisa? Did you send me that picture? There was a somebody. I think it was out on uh, Blanchard Road when it was out. Did you send me that? When the truck? <laughs> it was. It was like a 13 foot or 14 foot section of road that was just completely washed out, and this brand new super nice truck was just was was nose down in it. I don't know what they were thinking. Whether <laughs> Okay, well that ruins my analogy, but thank you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but a roadblock <laughs> a roadblock is there to keep us from going to places that we shouldn't and and there's nothing wrong with doing that. And this is key because biblical standards should be something that we lovingly encourage others to adopt. Okay, so hear me saying this. Biblical standards are something that we should lovingly, okay, did you hear those two words? Biblical standards lovingly encourage. I want that to hit home because the church has been very bad about this and we're even seeing it here with the Pharisees. They were taking extra biblical things and adding them on to the law in order to keep them. And again, again, I have to, I have to, no, maybe I don't. I think for, for, for my own peace of mind or my own encouragement, maybe, I have to believe that the intent initially was good, right? We're like, we want to be holy. We want to stay away from these things that God has asked us to stay away from. And so we're going to put something in the way. We're going to put this action in the way. And then, ooh, we're still a little too close. Like, I can still see the sin. I can still see the, and so we're going to put another one in the way. And we're going to get as far away from, they took the Ten Commandments. They added, what, some 600 other, I'm spitting all over the place, 600 other uh, uh, things and laws into, into place that were extra biblical things. So hear me saying, biblical standards, encouraging other people to adopt biblical standards lovingly and graciously. It's, that's a good thing. But where the problem starts is when we impose, when you impose extra biblical standards, meaning things that are outside of Scripture extra biblical standards when we impose those on others and create new standards and then you get offended when they don't keep those standards when they don't live up to those standards when they don't follow those same extra biblical things that you feel are important so I think it's important for us not think I know it's important for us to know what scripture says and live the standards that are laid out for us in the word. And then we show grace when we have other standards that, that maybe we've put in place so for our own personal spiritual uh, protection or safety. Or, uh, but when other people don't have those same standards, we have to show grace in those things. Examples of this could be 
see the way you dress, the way you pray, the way you worship, the way you keep your house, the way you act in church, the way you choose to school your kids, tattoos, voting Republican, voting Democrat, drinking alcohol, dancing, instruments in church, etc. about the standard of married people choosing not to ever be alone with the opposite sex. <clears throat> Even in business situations, <clears throat> whether it's a meeting over a meal out to lunch or a meeting in the office, <clears throat> the intent behind this is wise and believe me, I am all for this practice. Katie and I tried to try to do this in our lives, protecting our marriage and our, our uh, and protecting ourselves from any accusations and things like that. I'm all for this practice, but I, I have to understand that as far as I know and as far as I can tell, this is an extra biblical standard. It's wise, okay? Please don't hear me saying, <laughs> please hear me saying, this is why, I believe this is wise, but it's an extra biblical standard, so I can't get upset when other Christians don't adopt the same standard. And again, as wise as I feel this practice is, it many times can be an outward display, sometimes a false display of righteousness. You can do everything right on the outside, but the heart is what matters. And this is what Jesus is talking about. This standard, what about the husband or wife who is unwaveringly strict in this standard? Unwaveringly strict, and they proudly wear it, but secretly he or she is addicted to pornography. Outwardly everything looks good and we're doing all the right things. But inside, saying, what good is the outward action if the heart is not known? Nobody's getting it. Again, I, discretion is very wise. <laughs> I don't know how many times I, I, I'm going to say that often because I want you to hear it. But to claim that someone is unspiritual or unfaithful because they don't follow the same standard is a problem. These kinds of scenarios happen all the time. We can put all of these things on the outside, but on the inside, I have a pride problem. I have a lust problem. I have a lying problem. All of these things that, this is what Jesus is saying, this is the stuff that matters. You've got to deal with this, or what everyone else sees on the outside really doesn't matter. This is the exact kind of culture that the Pharisees created in Jesus' day. And Jesus called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. And my fear is that many of us are living as whitewashed tombs. And I would be failing you as a shepherd, as a leader, as a, as a pastor. We would be failing you if we did not preach and teach the same things that Jesus did. And he's saying what matters in here, you have to deal with this. This is what matters most. Whitewashed tombs look great on the outside, but are dead on the inside. What may have started out as innocent standards of righteousness standards that <clears throat> are outside of the scope of what the actual law required. And Jesus was pointing out that the, the, the measuring stick you're using, the standard that you're using is flawed. Because in Jesus' day, generally, the general population saw those Pharisees and those Sadducees, those religious leaders as the standard. 
and they're saying, they're saying, oh man, I gotta, I gotta be like that. That's the religious standard. That's, that's what I have to live up to. That's what I have to try to be. And if I can, if I can do that, if I can be that, then I'll be righteous and, and, and I'll, and God will be pleased with me. He's saying, he's saying your measuring stick is wrong. He says in Matthew uh, 520, he says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. He's saying, and, and, I, and I think most people probably heard that and were like, I'm done. I'm out. Like, it was already, they already saw that as something that was unattainable for most people. It was something that most people, and the Pharisees knew this too. They're like, you're never going to, you're, you're never going to be this. You can't be this. And they wore that as, a, and that puffed them up. And it was this pride thing, like, we're better than you. And Jesus is now saying, unless you, unless your righteousness goes beyond that, you're done. You can't get into the kingdom of heaven. And so finally, so people are just going, well, what hope do I have? He's saying, your measuring stick is wrong. And he goes and he lays out that for them so that they understand what the measuring stick is. And that's what we're going to look at as we, as we dive into this, this sermon. Jesus' primary purpose in preaching the Sermon on the Mount is to bring us to a mature understanding, to move us from an infancy understanding to a mature understanding of God's law, to understand that outward religious actions will get us nowhere in God's kingdom if they are not motivated from a heart that is righteous. Prayer here at Central Church is that we would be a mature, we would be mature in our understanding of what God is asking of His people. That we would not put on a righteous show, we would not simply do what we think we should because we want to save face or impress people, but rather that our hearts would be cleansed by the blood of Jesus and purified by the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as we move forward, we're going to jump into this uh, into this sermon that Jesus preached, and uh, and we're going to see what he says his kingdom should look like, what he says righteousness looks like, what he says are important actions because it's his kingdom, right? If he's king, if he's king, period. But more specifically. If he is king of your life, you are a part of his kingdom then. And therefore, our actions, our attitudes, our words, our thoughts, our heart should line up with his standards and with his requirements. Right? Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you for this short time we have here this morning, and I pray that, um, again, whatever we came in with, those burdens you've asked us to lay at your feet, that uh, that we would do that in great freedom and peace, and I pray that uh, as we're challenged by your word, it wouldn't be something that we just uh, hear and do nothing with, but uh, would make us uncomfortable enough to to change and look to you and be more dependent on you and more attentive to your spirit working in us. And we need your help because uh, being a part of this and, and uh, the things that you're doing and, and calling us to, it goes against our sin nature. And, uh, and so we need your help to, uh, to come under that authority. so much hope and there's so much blessing and there's so much mercy and grace and, and love. And, uh, I thank you for the privilege of being called your sons and daughters and uh, all of the things that, that come along with that, uh, with that, that privilege. 
today that we would have opportunities to come across people who need to understand your love and your grace and your mercy in their life and that that we would not be able to shut up and that you would be able to give us the courage to to speak about your goodness and your love. Welcoming others into the kingdom as well and growing in our maturity and our understanding of what that is. So we need your help and we're grateful that you uh, you offer it freely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Whatever you're doing, have a fantastic rest of your day. And uh, if you want to talk about anything, I'll make myself available. If you need prayer for anything, physical, spiritual, emotional needs, uh, we genuinely want to join in uh, taking those things before Jesus and and standing with you in those things. If not, have a fantastic day fellowshipping here until you leave, and then 